Hi friends, uh, welcome to Pushing Beyond the Obvious. Uh, I'm your host Mukesh Gupta. As you know, um, we are in the fifth season of the podcast and uh, I wanted to thank all of you for your continued support. This season is all about leadership uh, and leadership not just in general, but also in the world that we are living in, which is surrounded by smart machines and intelligent algorithms. So what I've been doing in this uh, season is to bring in leaders and thought leaders and practitioners uh, from varied industries with, who have some very specific skill sets that they bring to the table, which I believe is uh, really important for us as leaders to cultivate amongst ourselves in order to not only stay relevant, but also to do really well uh, in whatever organization that we are leading. In the same series, I'm super glad to uh, invite and host uh, Damien uh, on this episode of Pushing Beyond the Obvious. So before we go any further, uh, can I ask yourself, Damien, to kind of you know, introduce yourself, um, the body of work that you've done, and maybe share with us something that uh, uh, kind of answers the question, if you knew me really well, you would know that. Just complete this interview. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for having me here today. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone, my name is Damien Cummings. So, uh, I guess a little bit about my background. I've spent about 30 years as a digital guy. So, that started out way, way, way back in the uh, doc, before the dot com boom. I uh, started my career at McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm, uh, became an entrepreneur during the dot com boom and learned a lot by doing. Uh, then, I had a couple of interesting jobs in Australia where I was kind of a head of digital or the equivalent. Came to Singapore 15 years ago, uh, 16 years ago now, and uh, had a few jobs then. Started at Ogilvy, the advertising agency, then I went over to Dell to run their kind of consumer and SMB business online. I uh, became a marketer for a while, uh, so I was the regional marketing uh, director for Samsung and later the chief marketing officer for Philips across the APEC region. Uh, and my last corporate gig was at Standard Chartered, uh, where I was the global head of digital marketing. I went back into entrepreneurship, but that uh, recently kind of uh, after about four and a half years of doing a, a startup called PeopleWave, uh, we're trying to revolutionize HR, onboarding and performance management. Unfortunately, it came to a crashing halt during the COVID pandemic. So the good news is I landed on my feet and for the last uh, almost three years now, I've been at the National University of Singapore, uh, uh, NUSISS, where I'm the chief of digital strategy and leadership practice. So uh, everything about the intersection of kind of leadership and technology, uh, I, it's my day job now. So it's a lot of fun. So if, if, can you answer the question, if you really knew me, you would know? If you really knew me, you would know that I spend too much time with my dog at the moment. Every presentation I do, I've got to introduce Shiro, the Wolfie Samoyed and his Instagram channel. Uh, trying to be in the relentless bump to try to get some followers for that. Uh, I think we've got about 800 so far, so it's, it's far from a global influencer. But uh, yeah, I have to explain every time I've got some white dog hair on my uh, suit or I'm kind of, you know, trying to sell someone to go to his Instagram as uh, my dog is a big part of my life at the moment. Nice. So um, coming back to uh, the intersection of uh, digital or technology and leadership. So uh, you said you are currently uh, leading um, uh, the digital uh, strategy and leadership practice at NUSS, uh, NUS ISS. So what does it mean? So do you teach uh, at NUS? Uh, do you, what, what does that mean? Yeah, it's an initial title. And it's more because of the uh, ISS within uh, NUS has a long and unusual history. So we've historically done all kinds of things from research to postgraduate degrees. And now we've kind of settled on roughly about 50% doing executive education uh, with, uh, you know, all the big business leaders out there that need to go through a transformation. And the other half is graduate programs. So uh, being a chief of digital strategy and leadership practice is a very fancy way of saying I'm a lecturer, but I also lead a team of lecturers. And my subject matter area is uh, business leadership, uh, digital strategy, digital transformation, and, you know, all those cool topics that are interesting at the moment. Uh, anything from blue ocean strategy and how to re reinvent business models all the, all the way through to how business leaders should be using AI. Nice. So that brings us the, to the uh, topic at hand that uh, we wanted to cover today, right? Which is uh, today we are living in a world where we are surrounded by um, artificial intelligence um, uh, bots all around us, uh, right from chat GPT to a stable diffusion to many, many other um, uh, applications that have proliferated our um, um, workspace, so to say, and mind space. 
Uh, given all of this, um, what do you see the role of a leader uh, in navigating the current world that we live in uh, for the team as well, right? So there's just too many things happening at the same time. And sometimes the teams are a little confused and in the state of confusion, one of the things that people typically do is they freeze, right? So all decision-making comes to a halt. Uh, there is no um, a movement forward. Uh, and that kind of poses the risk of extinction as well if you don't do anything about it. So what in your experience have you seen uh, happen and how does one as a leader navigate this minefield? It's a big question, but um, you know, you're know you right about one key thing. Uh, we're living in exponential times. So I think those of us who've gone through things like uh, the technology revolution, using a computer and using a mobile phone, all the way through the last 20, 25 years or so using the internet, now digital platforms and so on, I think we all feel a bit tired. Uh, there's been a lot of um, disruption coming to the market and you can see traditional companies are simply not keeping up. I mean, the average lifespan of a company is only 16 years anyway, so it's it's not like, you know, uh, we're going to be around forever. But having said that, uh, yeah, I think a lot of business leaders going through traditional, uh, you know, leaving, uh, leaving school, going into university, getting an MBA, uh, working in a corporate job, that kind of job is disappearing. That kind of mindset is disappearing. And what we're seeing is that, um, yeah, the AI is the next big kind of uh, technology foundation, the next big you know, platform that's going to take us somewhere else. And we're going on this kind of J curve of, you know, exponential growth, learning and, and change. So in terms of leadership, what do you need to do? I mean, the core of leadership won't change, but the execution of it will. So they say that AI, by even by the end of next year, will start replacing up to 80% of somebody's day job. If you're a white collar worker, if you send emails, you... Uh, great PowerPoint presentations. There's, a, there's an AI co-pilot can do all that kind of faster, better, and more efficient than you can. Uh, there's even talk that uh, in a few years, there's going to be some, you know, maybe some, sounds outrageous now, but a few companies are going to take on an AI as their CEO. And then maybe a few countries that actually might elect an AI as their kind of president or prime minister or, or head of state. Uh, that feels like science fiction, but if you've used some of these tools, you realize that they're actually pretty good. And the role of a leader, coming back to the key question, is ultimately about making decisions. AI can do that better than we can, and it will get better over time. So we're really dealing with a baby AI uh, world right now. But also the human elements are gonna be just as important. So have a think about you know, the idea of actually setting a vision, taking people on a journey with you. Uh, even if you are a reduced workforce because robots and AI are taking over, you still need to galvanize the team together, have a very clear North Star. Because that's one thing AI is not really going to be good at. It doesn't really give you that creative direction of where the organization or where a team is going to go. So humans can still predict the future, but you know, robots and AI can help us get there. And the good leaders are going to actually have those skill sets, develop that future thinking mindset, and actually kind of galvanize the trips around what that vision looks like. Interesting. So uh, what if I understand what you said, uh, what some of the skills that leaders will need to develop is... Uh, the ability to paint a vision, first conceive a vision and then paint one for others to kind of, you know, uh, rally around. Um, so which is something that uh, even today leaders are expected to do. So what is going to be different from what they are doing now uh, to uh, what they will be doing in the future? Maybe reduced workforce. Uh, how does one include the different AIs, uh, the different ad chatbots? Um, so... I'm having a little bit of a challenge in terms of you know, thinking, is there anything different at all or is it just the same, but at a different scale? Um, let's say it's, it's largely the same with a different scale and a different expectation or a different uh, output at the end. So right now, kind of most leaders can set a vision, but they can't act on it. It's only the very few, very, very disruptive companies, mainly Silicon Valley based, that can actually truly get things done. Everyone, every other leader around the world, maybe they're in a family-run company, maybe they're in a conglomerate in Asia, is really just kind of keeping their lights on. They're stuck in a business-as-usual kind of mentality. And uh, that's the big change. So only, let's call it 5% of leaders are truly those transformational, you know, navigating disruption leaders. Uh, let's say about 80 to 90% of leaders are really just kind of keeping the lights on inside their organization. They don't have to think about AI or they take direction from a boss in somewhere in the US or the UK. They don't have to think too hard. 
but uh, the ability for you know all leaders at all levels to actually kind of have this north star ability is going to be key so it's almost like you know leaders need to be super adaptable uh, they need to be a lot more versatile and they've got to realize the context of actual disruption is going to happen in their local organization in singapore or in asia or wherever that may be so i don't think we're going to see kind of lazy mbas kind of sitting on their laurels anymore or you know, family-run organizations, you know, thinking they're very secure because they're a farm or have physical assets. I mean, you know, this new kind of wave of technology is going to disrupt almost everything, and we're going to have a future leader that has that kind of skill set thing and navigate those waters. Mm, interesting. So, given that this is the context, and in the past, I mean, I've I've read studies both from McKinsey as well as now from many many other uh, research firms as well that most of the digital transformation programs um, end up failing to deliver mm -hmm. their main objective. Um, so I think if I'm not wrong, there is an often cited study, which I've been trying to find out, but I haven't been able to let, get my hands on it, on the original study, which is McKinsey saying 70% of all change initiatives fail. Um, and I, I think if I'm not wrong, I read somewhere that 85% of digital transformation initiatives fail uh, to deliver their results. So given that that is where we are, how do we move from here to the future that you're painting in terms of, you know, where all leaders across all levels need to be, number one, tech savvy, number two, be uh, able to, you know, navigate uh, change faster, decide faster. So how do you bridge this gap? Um, bridge this gap? Do you see anyone who's done this effectively? Well, let me talk about where the problem lies first. So, um, yeah, you're right. Anywhere between seven and about 84% of uh, organizations just can't d deliver on a digital transformation or even a post-digital kind of project implementation anymore. Uh, if you break it down into the elements, you, you need to have a good strategy, number one. You need to have engagement from the organization, number two. You've got to be driving innovation, number three. Uh, you've got to actually have the technology to it up. Uh, four and fifth element um, is the, the data. You've got to be measuring where you go. But underpinning all that is people. But um, the the problem most leaders are seeing today is that they have people inside their organization. You know, super gung ho kind of executive team. They really want to make change. Uh, they get paid the big bucks to make those change. You've got new hires or junior employees that are coming in. Those guys are really ramped up and they really want to make a change as well. They want to make a difference. But the problem is you've got your frozen middle. The people, for whatever reason, are either fence sitters or apathetic to what their senior leadership proposes. They're there for the paycheck and nothing wrong with that. That's great. But having said that, you know, 70% of all these problems, 70% of the 70% is lack of engagement. It's when the frozen middle just kind of seizes up and just doesn't want to execute your change. Uh, they're not sabotaging it deliberately. The best might they might be a little bit apathetic around it, but usually digital transformation is a shortcut for job losses. You know, let's you know, let's go to um, if you're in the banking banking world, uh, online banking, uh, mobile banking, etc. But we'll cut retail branches and and even ATMs to support that. So therefore, you've got a lot of people inside those organizations. They're not comfortable with either laying people off or losing the jobs themselves. So they become stuck as well, and they're not going to support a program that's going to drive that. Now, the interesting change is, is disruption. Now, one of the biggest disruptors we've seen in this part of the world has been, you know, Uber and later Grab and Gojek and so on. But the local taxi companies uh, are now getting swallowed up by them. Now, you know, guys like Comfort Delgro in Singapore have an amazing um, history and experience in, the, in that space, a huge amount of capital, smart leaders. But couldn't make the, the leap into, you know, really kind of destroying their core business. So what they needed to do was really kind of rethink maybe kind of having a, a side business, which was an online kind of a, a booking service, which would have connected uh, drivers to potential customers. But you know, they, I think they were stuck in the mindset where they were frozen. They, they didn't want to make those big changes because they had to destroy something to get there. And I think, you know, those two issues, one, having a frozen middle of, in general, but number two, the ability to navigate digital disruption, not by kind of being smart and doing an online course or anything like that, but understanding that a, any kind of big disruption means a business model disruption, it means that you have to do things differently and you have to actually destroy your core business to do something wildly different. I see the same in, in, in software now and maybe a little bit closer to your world. Uh, with the ability for generative AI to actually kind of custom create apps, 
we're just seeing the beginning of a revolution over the next five or 10 years, which is going to be really interesting. So if an SME, small business, uh, could go into a chat GPT-like interface, say that I want a messaging tool, I need it to be purple, I need to send an attachment and do some emojis, within a few simple prompts, you should be able to generate something that works like a, like WhatsApp or WeChat. Now, again, that's that's billion dollars worth of R&D and work and so on, but an SME is getting it for virtually free. Does that mean that the, the providers of CRM and ERP, financial systems, HR tech, and so on, are uh, going to face an extra central crisis? Maybe. Uh, it does mean that a big chunk of the custom base is going to move towards self-service for technology, and then, but are, are the leaders of those companies prepared for it? Or are they still trying to hire large groups of salespeople and account managers to look after a very few a bunch of enterprise customers and kind of let the SMEs do their own thing? I'm not sure, but all these kind of things lead to you know frozen middle, disruptive business models, having to kind of just dis destroy the core business to do something different, and just maybe sometimes intentional blindness to what's coming, maybe. Interesting. So if if I hear you correctly, what uh, the sense that I'm getting is um, one of the key skills that uh, leaders will need to do is to be able to make sense of everything that is happening. Um, and then have a clear strategy in mind, develop ability to create and develop clear strategy in terms of what needs to be done and then go out and get uh, it executed sometimes through technology, sometimes through people. Did I get, is my sense of understanding right there? Yeah, and I think um, if I kind of look at what I just said, I mean, some of the takeaways as well is, you know, act like an agile startup as well. Uh, you know, don't um, dismiss kind of disruptive technology as it comes in, but actually take it super seriously. Uh, you know, so whether you're a software company or even like a company like Google, uh, you know, they've, they've taken the threat of AI, which attacks their, I think their 93% advertising led business. So all the revenue comes from that. So if something attacks their core search business, they've got to take super seriously. And a company like that does, but very few others do. So if you've got a, a core, you know, a, a new technology, which is super disruptive, which might impact the world of software development or might impact the world of uh, getting a taxi, uh, most companies and most CEOs of those companies are, are leaders and just generally ignoring it, hope for the best, away from decisions from the UK or US head office. But the reality is in this new world, things happen so fast, you've got to make a call locally. Or you've got to leave that company and, and launch your own with, in a way that makes sense to compete with what's happening in the disruptive world. Yeah. So that's the other thing that uh, I'm, um, not just me, I mean, I see a lot of people struggle with is the pace of it all. Um, before yeah. you are even, uh, you've even learned about something that is already, uh, that is disrupting what you've learned already in the market. And it feels at times as if, you know, you're just running really, really hard. And yet with, instead of making progress, you're actually going, moving back in uh, time. Um, so, so, I mean, so what does one do about it? To keep pace so, with all of this change. <laughs> well, let, let me give you a sense of what my day looks like and the things that I work on to try to keep up to date with digital. Uh, so, you know, again, I'm already a 30 year veteran in the space. I've done pretty much you can within the old world of digital. Uh, I'm just about to complete another executive master of digital transformation. Uh, I've started my doctorate, um, uh, you know, a PhD kind of course, uh, looking at digital platforms and the intersection of artificial intelligence on those. So I spent a lot of my day kind of researching, but also using AI tools to help me research, find leads, find journals and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing that for fun and to keep up. My day job is also about kind of being a thought leader in this space as well. So. You know, every week I'm teaching the class would be blue ocean strategy or strategic thinking or digital foresight, uh, you know, predicting the future and so on. That that also means that I've got to keep up with the latest trends there. I'm writing a book at the moment. So I'm illustrating that book by using mid journey and so on to kind of do images and so on. Uh, I'm looking at uh, AI assisted writing tools that are going to help me flesh out character stories and backgrounds and so on. Uh, and I'm also, you know, I, I have my own side hustle going on. So I've got my uh, launching my own digital platform, which is a social network, a video sharing network. So I do all that and I'm still struggling. 
Uh, I'm thick, I'm very thick into the world of digital, digital transformation technology. I've learned how to code digital platforms like my, my platform sooner. Uh, I've learned, you know, I'm doing PhD, master's degree, uh, doing it for my own thing, which I'm deeply passionate about writing my own book and so on. And I'm just barely keeping up. So, uh, you know, I think we all looked at when we went through the original digital revolution, people who were printing out emails, you know, senior leaders who needed their email printed off or someone to fax them the information. And, you know, it was kind of a bit of a joke. But now you're seeing a lot of people struggle with you know, the basics of AI and the basics of what happening with new technology. We're all going to be left behind. And we're moving to the stage where uh, technology is becoming to become a bit like magic. We don't understand how it works anymore. When my AI is talking to your AI and, and my AI is just sending you emails or messages and your AI is responding, when you kind of press a simple prompt to get a, a PowerPoint presentation, we're going to lose a lot of the craft. And I think it's it's going to be a very tough, you know, small element in society that's really still across technology because a lot of us, the average business leader, will be left behind. And the question is, how do you keep up? You know, I've got no idea. Uh, I'm doing too much and I'm going to burn out if I'm kind of continuously doing all those kind of stuff to keep up. Uh, it's tough if you're just doing LinkedIn learning or online learning, Coursera or something, you know, uh, doing podcasts like this are also very helpful. But, you know, I think you've got to usually have two or three fingers in two or three different pies to understand the, you know, hands on of the technology. Otherwise, you'll definitely get left behind. Uh, so what I have learned um, after having many, many conversations like these and asking the same very question to many, many people and thinking about it deeply is that you will never be able to keep up with uh, everything that is going to come at you. So all we need to do as a leader is uh, pick something uh, uh, and instead of waiting for us to get to speed with everything that is there on that area, pick something that solves a specific problem that we are having right now and use the technology to solve the problem. Once it is solved, then again, look at what's available and pick something and solve a particular problem. Uh, again, we rinse and repeat, right? So always look at it from the context of a particular problem that you're trying to solve and look at all the different tools that are available at that point in time, pick one and act. So if we wait for us to figure out and understand everything that uh, is there to be figured out and understood, uh, all that will lead to is uh, paralysis uh, by analysis and we will never be able to get anything done at all because there's just too much um, uh, happening out there. Yeah, but I haven't, th I haven't think about that though. I mean, uh, I agree with you. It makes a lot of sense. But what happens to the craft? I mean, none of us are learning stuff anymore. Uh, we are going to become some sort of robots and is the only skill the leader needs to develop is understanding which tool to use. It might be going down that path, but you know the ability for someone to craft even something simple like a PowerPoint presentation or write a 10-page Word document, those skills are going to be left behind pretty soon. So very few people are going to know how to do that. If you simply kind of plug in something to your AI assistant and then it generates something for you, we're going to kind of, I think we're going to have a dumbed down later layer of leadership that just don't know how to do stuff anymore. And that's very worrying, mm. but is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no, so I think what you're saying is absolutely right. Uh, in fact, um, if I look at a, look around the world today, um, I'm already worried at the state of leadership uh, around me, whether it is uh, leadership in business, whether it is leadership in, in the political sphere, all the different problems that we are seeing today, uh, whether it is the conflicts that we are seeing, whether it is the, whether we see the polarizations that are uh, everywhere uh, happening. I personally feel that it is all because of a, uh, lack of uh, good leadership because if if we have good leaders then they would understand uh, the implications of uh, the polarization they would understand the implications of the conflict and we would not be where we are today so given that we are already seeing uh, there are issues in, in terms of the quality of leaders that we are producing as a as a uh, society uh, what you're saying uh, is also something which uh, worries me because um, dumb, being dumbed down uh, in terms of you know if you if you use a technology to do everything for you, then you're not applying your mind. You're not uh, bringing in the nuance that uh, humans are capable of. Uh, uh, so I, I have a feeling that uh, while um, the artificial intelligence as a, uh, as a technology 
will be significantly used going forward when it comes to businesses but i have also a feeling that uh, uh, there will come a point in time when uh, anything and everything that uh, people see which is non uh, which is not synchronous which is which means it is not live people will tend to kind of you know uh, ignore or find a way to uh, put it below par and anything and everything that you do synchronously is what uh, will actually um, get or have a lot more weight if you know what i mean and uh, unfortunately what this uh, world that we are living in does is uh, it creates uh, big winners and big losers um, uh, and i do not know how do you address that because that's a big problem that uh, we will end up with because um a bulk of managers uh, and leaders will actually get uh, uh, ai to do all their work uh, which means that their personal ability to think make sense and uh, decide uh, will be much less uh, than those very few leaders who will be able to uh, still resist uh, use the ai tool where necessary uh, uh, but at the same time understand that you know not everything needs to be outsourced uh, to an ai tool and therefore also have the ability to make sense of the world that we are living in and um um use some of the technologies like for example uh, foresight and um, you know um, the ability to take decision and understanding what when to use ai and when not to use ai and those kind of leaders will be far and few and those will then have wield significant amount of influence than anybody else and that also is is a world which is not really Uh, ideal right because then it's it's the similar structure that we have today in the internet where we have a whole a few corporates which uh, dominate uh, the value capture in the uh, entire digital uh, stream so to say i have no idea how uh, this will play out but uh, um, none of what i can think of gives me comfort uh, uh, in a way and that is also one of the reasons why i am talking to a lot of people trying to understand multiple perspectives in terms of you know where do they see the world going and that's also the conversation that we are having today as well right to see yeah, where this sense. world is going so uh coming back to uh, leadership and strategy to say uh, let's 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 talk a little bit about strategy um as far as i understand strategy is about uh, making choices and killing of choices to be more precise um at least that's my understanding of strategy um what are some of the things that uh, as a leader um, one needs to understand about strategy and how can one get good at creating uh, strategies i mean right strategy at the heart of it's a very simple thing you know you you're at a today what do you want to be in b and this is going to be over a mid to long term horizon and uh, you're trying to you know create and capture long term value that's what it's all about but the problem is that that kind of plan never kind of works uh, there's going to be a million pivots along the way there so i mean and the first skill set is you know understanding what that north star is so exactly what that end point looks like for you uh, and yeah i mean uh, simon sinek talks about the infinite game where you know it's not about winning it's about just staying in the game uh, so strategy is an always on thing as well so you know at a point in time let's pick 2030 because it's 7 years out So what is the strategy look like in 2030 or 2033 2033 or 2040 uh you know that's a reasonably long time frame what is your organization people look like at that point so that that's relatively easy the hard bit is um turning that into a you know set of products and solutions what what problem are you actually solving and uh, that's a much more challenging thing that even the smartest people in the world often get that wrong uh too many people to kind of throw products at customers and hope for the best Uh, a lot of talk around using things like uh, design thinking uh jobs to be done to understand customer needs but the reality is it's all kind of surface dressing uh the reality is most business leaders never going to get in front of customers don't have a deep understanding of the customer problem and and don't really care about solving that problem they want to sell kit they want to sell stuff uh so that that's problematic so you know understanding those deep levels of problems and using both data and insights as well as uh emotional connection to those customers i think is going to be you know what leaders need to deep dive into and again as as we were touching on earlier when ai is kind of doing doing all the repeated repetition tasks and all the stuff 
I mean, there's going to be a premium on human knowledge, you know, uh, human connectivity, imagination, creativity, ethics, morals. And I think that's going to formulate as part of strategy as well. People need to kind of really kind of pull together those uh, work streams around, you know, uh, creativity, imagination, ethics, and how to engage consumers better to solve problems. And from there, it's making it's about marshalling resources. If you're a small business, you would know this very, very well, or a startup, you've got to raise capital, you've got to get a team, you've got to get people that believe in your vision and believe where you're going to be a, a billion dollar business or whatever your end goal is. Uh, if you're in a large corporate, it's um, similar. You know, you need to be an inspirational leader, not a terrible manager. Uh, you've got to take them on a journey of self-discovery, learning and development, personal growth, career growth, and so on. And um, that's tough because, you know, managers are generally faceless people to the potential employees. So it's not really clear about who those people are. Uh, and startups are a little bit easier because it's, it should be clearly solving a problem. But yeah, uh, so strategy going from A to B is simple. Uh, having a clear vision of how you get there is a bit tougher. Solving the problem of customers very specifically is tougher again. And then the real test of a leader is can they bring people on that journey with them? So that's the next point that I want to touch upon, which is uh, engagement, right? So that's that's all about engagement. So once you have the strategy, if you really want to execute on the strategy, you need people to, number one, agree that yes, that's the way to go and to kind of, you know, um, go with you and do the work that needs to be done. So what can leaders do uh, to drive up that engagement level? I think we've got to be, you know, honest about what's happening with the the strategy, the product, or whatever's rolling out. Uh, I mean, let's be clear: most people don't care. Most employees simply don't care. Uh, you know, if they, they want to get a promotion, they'll butt kiss, butt kiss the boss and say they support this project and so on. But yeah, again, people just don't care. Um, the, the other part of that kind of not caring is that uh, often a new project, you're not handed tons of money to go execute something. Uh, that never happens. So there's always a trade-off and a compromise. In large companies, that's really about uh, uh, actually being clear about what the benefits or ROI is. And again, you know, it would be great if it's additional revenue to a commercial organization, but often it's about cutting costs. And what I tend to find is that from the engagement perspective, there's always someone who's afraid of that project or outcome. Uh, a simple example was um, uh, I used to work at a, a tech company that uh, rolled out Salesforce. Uh, all the salespeople needed to use, um, you know, a CRM tool to help them kind of manage their leads and so on. Because historically, they had that as you know, human face-to-face -face leads written down on the back of a napkin or an Excel spreadsheet. But the problem is, you know, we almost had had daily meetings with salespeople because they weren't going into their kind of CRM, Salesforce CRM, to update the data. And, uh, you know, it became, you know, I don't think we ever got above 85% of the team ever doing that. And it was it was not big, it was mainly because those salespeople were the losers. So sure, it was great for the organization the senior leaders to see where the sales data was coming from and get a sense of the pipeline. Great, right? but salespeople are not admin people. They they hate putting stuff into a system. Second part of it is um you know there's more of a cultural thing. Well you know these are my leads. I've developed them out of my LinkedIn. I've met them face to face. This is my you know best friend or third cousin or whatever that may be. Uh, you know these are people are very protective of those kind of context leads and sales opportunities. So kind of basically just giving them back to the company in a very open spreadsheet kind of manner in a, in a CRM solution is not culturally accepted. So, you know, those kind of things actually caused, you know, a CRM rollout to fail and uh, addressing that could have been very simple. Just ask the salespeople, you know, be clear about the what's in it for me, for them. Uh, you should always identify who the loser is in a situation trying to make them the winner. You know, senior leadership are never going to be the loser rolling out a CRM. They're always going to win. The salespeople have to give up their contacts, actually do additional work and so on. They're losers. Uh, so you can make them winners if you help them with the admin. You can reassure them about leads and whatever that is. Um, I've also worked in organizations where you, the, you have to lay people off to actually make something happen. And I hate that. It's the worst. Whenever you have to do that, it's, 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 it's soul destroying. But if you can avoid that, you should actually try to do something that, you know, think beyond the boundaries of the directive given to you. How can we save money from other areas? Or how can we make this a revenue spinner rather than sort of a cost-cutting exercise? If you can do that and you can save someone's job, you turn a whole bunch of people who are massive detractors into huge advocates. And if you get to turn those detractors into advocates, suddenly the frozen middle unthaws, 
suddenly the engagement goes through the roof and whatever project you're trying to execute will win. So it's a simple, simple rule. Find the losers, make them the winners. Go through a, uh, forget the direction that you're initially being given to, to actually go deeper inside the problem to understand how to solve it. And, you know, always work on the what's in it for me, for those affected groups. Interesting. So it, it all boils down to uh, the soft skills, which are, which are really hard uh, uh, in a way, right? So yeah, the yeah. ability to identify who the losers are and understanding why people behave the way they behave uh, in a given context. So for example, I've, I've had the same situation where uh, the sales guys do not want to go and enter details in the sales pipeline in the CRM system simply because uh, they don't want the top management to know every deal that they are working on because mm. uh, the moment you put everything, uh, radical transparency and the expectations from the leadership team also changes uh, once they see all the leads are there and they get start they, uh, they, they started to kind of, you know, put pressure on, on the sales executives to kind of, you know, close and which they don't want. And some of the leads they are there, they want to nurture for the next year or for the next next year. Um, uh, but the leaders, because of the pressure that they are on, want to want them to close it now, which only harms the sales guys in the next quarter or the next year or whatever is the is the thing. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I know for a matter of fact that the sales guys will never want to put everything into the system uh, um, for radical transparency as well. And that's exactly why the leadership team wants uh, the sales executives to put in because they want to know the state of the business. And it's kind of a conflict which needs to be resolved. And it requires a little bit of creativity, a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of understanding people's behavior in order to be able to resolve the conflict and therefore get the results that you want. So you also mentioned this a couple of times now, which is the ability to think, I mean, creative creativity and um, uh, imagination. So mm -hmm. the question that I have in that case is, uh, how does one nurture this ability to uh, think creatively or use imaginations to solve problems? Well, I've worked in some organizations where all we did was actually kind of talk about, about last week's revenue number. Uh, in fact, one tech company I worked for, we had uh, five meetings every week about last week's revenue number uh, because we had the kind of local kind of connects, uh, regional connects, global connects, you know, then there was kind of uh, BA, um, there was business units and uh, product areas that needed updates as well. So some were meetings about kind of uh, getting the numbers into the, the Word document or the spreadsheet. Others were kind of about reporting them and explaining them. And when you spend close to 100% of your time looking back, you never look forward. I mean, sure, you can actually do kind of corrective actions on the week-to-week -week basis, but none of that's really going to move the needle until some disruptive technology comes along and the whole business is going out of business. I think probably the number one skill that leaders could really start to do, use is um, thinking about the future. Uh, scenario planning, I think, is a very good one. Uh, if that's a kind of, you know, it doesn't have to happen all the time, but every time you're asked to do a major project, map out a scenario. It's very easy. You have your X and Y axes, you know, basically kind of grid it. Um, do two layers. Uh, these should be something on a spectrum. If I was talking about, say, NUS, uh, universities and the future of education, you ask one key question, what's the future of education look like in Singapore in 2030? Uh, one axis I might pick, which would be humanity, you know, AI versus robots. That's one axis. Uh, and then the other one might be international versus local. And then suddenly you've got four scenarios that self-populate, you know, AI driven, local, AI driven, international, human driven, international, human driven, local. Now you can imagine what that story might look like. The problem is I don't know of many leaders that have actually cultivated this scenario planning idea because what that does for you is, you know, with a couple of axes that are probably going to happen, um, you've now got four scenarios that you can either prepare for and be well prepared for anything that pops up. You know, that's where the creativity, divergent, convergent thinking comes in. That's where the imagination can run wild. But also, you can shape the future. You can actually pick one of these scenarios and make it a preferred future and do whatever you can to try to make that future come to, come to life. Uh, invest in the right people, invest in the right tech, uh, go out and acquire businesses and so on. Um, and I, I think, you know, I don't love what uh, Mark Zuckerberg has done with Facebook and now Meta. Uh, the company itself is, you know, terrible, terrible. Uh, but we're all users of those platforms. But 
what they did a few years ago by making a bold vision about what a metaverse was, I think was very courageous. Uh, it hasn't panned out, sure. But having said that, uh, they were kind of really trying to make their own future around people being connected into a kind of a, an immersive internet like the Matrix. And I still think there's going to be one of those metaverses that pop up and become real in the 2030s. Uh, but right now, I think um, you know most organizations don't have the courage or the resources to make it a, make a call like that. And I think bring it back to a uh, you know at an individual leadership level. Uh, next time you've got annual planning, next time you've got a project they need to execute, put them in scenarios. Uh, not about high, medium, low, or you know that's more about you know forecasting. But I'm talking about scenarios, so wildly divergent scenarios that could all be equally valid. Because once you do that, then there's a lot of interesting kind of conversations that can come up with AI or people or resources, new technology that can help you get there. But it just seems like a lot of uh, uh, leaders at the moment don't think that way. So therefore, it'd be nice to see more of that kind of come into leadership discussions. Absolutely. So in fact, uh, one of the guests that uh, we are planning to have on the podcast is uh, Dr. Sun Sohail Inayatullah. And uh, he's a futures expert, futures thinking expert. And uh, the conversation with him is going to be about uh, how does one go about thinking about futures and um, scenario planning and uh, I think various other tools that uh, are as, uh, are available as part of the toolkit of futures thinking in order for leaders to not only understand where the world is going towards in terms of um, predicting the future, what it could look like, but also in, in a way, as you said, uh, shape uh, the future as well. One of the best books that I've read and this is an old book. I don't think it's a new one. I think it's easily eight, 10 years old. It was a book called Flash Foresight. And uh, uh, it was written by a guy called Daniel Burris. And uh, I think he runs a consultancy company called Burris Research. And in which he talks about uh, soft trends and hard trends. He says that, you know, there are hard trends, which is 100% going to happen and will happen. Uh, for example, in a country aging of the population is a hard trend. Uh, at over a period of time, the entire population will age. So what does that provide you uh, as an opportunity or as a challenge? Uh, then there is uh, soft trends where uh, it may happen, the, the probability of it happening is then 50%, but you still have the ability to uh, influence it uh, in one direction or the other uh, through investments and through uh, decisions that you make within your organization as well and how the interplay between uh, riding between you know soft trends and hard trends uh, leaders can actually navigate the future slightly better than uh, if you are running um, uh, blind and i thought uh, uh, the concept of uh, soft trends and hard trends was pretty interesting uh, and for example one of the things that we are talking about today which is artificial intelligence in the workforce and um, I mean, I'm pretty sure it will get regulated. I'm pretty sure it will get watered down in terms of what is possible. Uh, today, all our imaginations are running wild. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are some dampeners um, uh, that will come along. But even after all of that, it is still going to be a breakthrough technology uh, that will get deployed in almost every single business. So what are some of the hard trends here that we can think of? What are some of the soft trends here that we can think of? Is a is is a is something that leaders can spend some time thinking about. And once you start thinking about them deeply enough, and not just thinking, when I say thinking, I don't just necessarily mean thinking by yourself. I think there is a lot of uh, benefit also in including your team in the conversation. You can talk about, and okay, here is what I'm thinking about uh, when it comes to the future, uh, both in terms of technology, in terms of where the technology is going and how it can be, applicable to our business and how we can actually leverage and benefit from it and ask them as to you know uh, what are some of the things that they are seeing uh, and what is it that they are um, excited about what is it that they are afraid of what is it that they are uh, you know you know sitting on the fence about and all of that uh, conversation i think is what makes the entire human existence and the leadership more human and uh, uh, gives you the ability and the data sets, uh, not necessarily the, um, the big data, but the contextual data sets in which uh, leaders can actually make sense. And once you've made sense of the world that we are going into and what is the world that we want to shape, um, 
can actually you know um, make uh, calls dis- define the strategy and the vision uh, and once you've involved your people in the journey then the chances that they are involved and engaged going forward is also slightly that much more higher um, if i may, if if i think so so switching tack a little bit right um, so we've so far talked about what as a leader we need to think about what we need to do are there some things that you think leaders should avoid doing um, things that uh, um, has the potential to do more harm than good yeah um you're seeing a lot of it actually come out of the us so a few disturbing trends i'm seeing so um our communications are becoming a little bit less human and i think um and that feels like it's generational younger people love using whatsapp signal telegram uh, those kind of messaging services to talk to each other but they're losing the art of uh, face-to-face communication i yeah you know, it's, it's not a kind of bash up of millennials or gen z versus boomers or anything else but what you're saying is that um, with AI and other tools, the the uh, power of face-to-face communications is going to come back. Uh, now, whether it be over a Zoom call like this or whether it be something else is, is a different story. But the ability to have uh, uh, interpersonal skills uh, is really comes to the fore when you have a conversation like we're having today. Uh, it, a lot is lost when you kind of communicate digitally through, you know, short messages or an emoji. That's that's one. So I think you know bringing back strong communication skills is key because we're losing them, uh, particularly the younger generation of leaders. Uh, the next thing is uh, the ability to take risks. So we're seeing that we're we're uh, hiring managers hire people that have done that same job for 10, 20 years. They're hiring the people that are the lowest cost but the lowest risk. Now, there's a lot of talk when you hire somebody that we want a, a game changer that's going to double our revenue and do these new initiatives. But the reality is. That's someone who's going to rock the boat. No one wants to hire a thought leader. No one wants to hire someone who does external guest speaking. No one wants to hire someone who wants to shake things up. What what they really want to do is hire someone who's been doing exactly the same job, will be stable in their job for two to three years. I don't have to rehire in six months' time and so on. So, you know, the ability to take risks both on people and also on strategy, uh, we're losing it. We're losing it because people, honestly, are trying to cover their butt too much. And it would be nice if uh, they came back and actually took more strong-willed action around hiring people, setting direction, taking measured risk, but uh, taking more risks. Because if you take no risks, it's it's terrible. And I think, you know, the, not getting into, you know, I don't want to talk about religion and politics, but I think a lot of what's happening is we're getting caught up in things that are trivial. Identity politics, all these kind of things when there are big, big issues in the world. And those things that are kind of making uh, workplaces very politicized, and uh, it's not good. Uh, I don't want to get caught up in conversations with team members around, you know, U.S. politics or uh, wars in different countries. Uh, important to have big conversations, but you know, the workplace can be distracted by these kind of discussions, particularly when uh, they're not adding any real value to the world. So I tend to find that, you know, particularly identity politics is a bit of a blight on the world. So we're going to avoid kind of actually going deep on those and having to say something about every issue. You know. Brands, companies, their products. You know, the real people behind that, sure. I mean, everyone wants to have a relationship with a person, not a brand. But it feels like everyone's jumping on different bandwagons nowadays. Big brands need to stand for something. And I think a lot of consumers are realizing this this feels a bit false and it feels a bit fake. And, you know, it's, you know, uh, people are giving up on brands if they have the wrong message. Or, and it feels, it feels like big corporations are trying to put you in a different bucket. And if you don't conform to that bucket, you know, the, they don't want you as a customer or vice versa. The customer doesn't want you as a product or so on. So I think that distraction is is causing a lot of angst over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, it would be nice if we can get rid of that. And, you know, uh, again, stand up and beliefs. I love that. But again, you know, in the workplace, you know, don't politicize it too much. Then I think we lose our way a little bit. Interesting. So... We are about nine minutes uh, left for this conversation. So I wanted to get back into some of the questions that I always ask all our guests um, uh, that we have on the show. So we today we spoke about the importance of um, ongoing learning and, uh, you know, uh, so how do you learn? So what's your learning methodology? 
Well, I mean, I do two things. I mean, I have to advocate, uh, you know, formal learning education. You know, master's degrees are great. Uh, again, you can go through a PhD and doctorate at the moment. So uh, I'm finding that is an eye opener. Uh, give me opening up into you know deepest of the deep and research and education and uh, looking at other people's theories in a very objective way is great uh, of course not everyone wants to go out and do a phd i get that but um what i do find is that what's much more valuable is go out and do uh, as i said i'm writing a book at the moment so i'm, I'm actually illustrating characters of that using midjourney dali and other uh, other platforms i'm using chat gpt or google bar to help me kind of write paragraphs or do storytelling approaches and so on. I find um, from an academic perspective, using tools like Scholar AI, it really helps. So I recommend get a project, get something that is, you're personally passionate about, figure out a whole bunch of digital and AI tools that can help you with that and get super hands-on because it's really hard to get hands-on in a work context because there's too much risk and too much to lose. But if it's a personal project, such as trying to get my dog's Instagram following up, uh, hi Shiro, uh, or it's trying to you know, write a book or you know, illustrate characters or something you're interested in doing, you know, it's a great way of getting super hands-on. Uh, so I uh, yeah, recommend get a side hustle, get a book, do some thought leadership, learn the tools, and that's going to be immensely helpful for you. Yeah, so learn by doing rather than just learn by uh, passively listening into something. That's Correct. So either, either do formal education or learn by doing. That's the two ways to do it. <laughs> Yeah. So the next question that I wanted to uh, ask you is, is there any resource, it could be a book, a movie, or some person that has had a significant impact on your thinking and on yourself? Well, lately, uh, there's a couple of kind of um, things I've been looking at. Um, Blue Ocean Strategy is one of them. So there's a whole bunch of Blue Ocean Strategy books. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Lean Startup by Eric Ries about, you know, the, doing, developing minimum viable products and moving fast and so on. Any entrepreneur, any intrapreneur should be reading that book. Um, and, you know, the what I found most useful and my biggest learning curve at the moment is using these AI tools. I'm using Synthesia to actually do AI uh, videos and avatars. I'm um, using uh, Midjourney primarily for uh, image generation, and usually it's uh, ChatGPT and Google Bard. They're useful for different things for uh, you know writing. So uh, that, that's a very useful tool as well. But yeah, so I think Blue, Blue Ocean Strategy helps you with business model thinking. Sure, it's a little bit overblown and a bit too formal with a whole bunch of frameworks, but the underpinning of that is very strong. Uh, yeah, if you're, you know, anyone who wants to run a business or, you know, be an entrepreneur, um, a lean startup is a fantastic resource as well. Super. Thank you so much for that. Um, so one of the uh, key things that differentiates us uh, uh, from a lot of the other species is our ability to uh, change our beliefs. So my question to you is, have you changed your belief about something recently and why? Yeah, I, I tend to try to have an open attitude to things, but I know I'm stubborn as well, so it, it's tough. Uh, for example, um, what changed my mind recently was seeing a video of um, introduction of credit cards into Burger King in 1993. And I look back over all the technology that people basically, you know, dump on. They think it's terrible, they're never going to work, you know, anything from the internet, you know, using credit cards in 1993 and you can't imagine a world that's you know isn't using credit cards nowadays. Uh, you know, Bill Gates being interviewed on a talk show and being asked what the internet was and is this ever going to take off? Um, I've personally been very skeptical of blockchain. Uh, I adapted it into my last startup business and I found it's useful in some areas. Uh, I've used things like NFTs um, and I've been very skeptical about the use case of those. But I've also kind of basically changed my mind. Uh, and I wanted to hold judgment. Don't be negative. Don't be too judgmental because usually all tech finds its way somewhere. Maybe, sure, maybe not all of us are going to have NFTs in three years' time. Maybe it's not going to be the big game changer, but something else will be. You know, we'll be moving to the next cluster of new technology introductions soon. So, you know, I like to try to keep an open mind if people can argue with facts, if you could see some. Uh, and I think the big thing was. I realized I've become a little bit too negative about new things that are coming in or new technologies that are there. And you want to, I want to take my, my own kind of perspective out and look at the data, look at the facts. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, I think all senior leaders are a little bit stubborn, a little bit set in their ways and always think they know a little bit best. Uh, it's nice to go out and, you know, humble yourself now and again, uh, start over like I've done a couple of times doing a master's degree a few years ago. 
know, I knew everything in the curriculum, but it was good to go through it, learn like a student, pretend, you know, not pretend like you're a know-it-all. No one wants to be the smartest person in the room, obviously in the wrong room if that's the case, but uh, you want to be the best learner in every room you can go to. And I find that's the best way to change your mind. Super. So one of the things that uh, uh, I have written in my uh, book, Thrive, is that um, the most important skill that uh, we will probably need in the world that we are going into is our ability to unlearn and relearn. So learning mm -hmm. how to learn uh, is going to be a meta skill that will underpin everything that uh, uh, we will need to do going forward. Um, so that's something that I just wanted to kind of bring to the conversation as well. So last question uh, for all our guests is that the show is called Pushing Beyond the Obvious. So what is so obvious to you, but people miss all the time, which makes you go, mm, mm. <laughs> Um, that new technology is all going to put us out of a job in five years' time. Uh, the jobs that we have won't exist certainly within 20 years, but certainly in five years' time. I've, something happened to me recently, um, and it started to make me think about the world in decades. What I was doing 20 years ago, what I might be doing 20 years from now. And I've never thought that way before. So, you know, I, I personally believe in, and this is way out there tech theory, but I believe in this idea of a tech singularity where AI is going to become smarter than the human population and uh, billions of times smarter than it is now. And uh, technology change and discoveries will become unchecked and uncontrollable, leading us to the world of science fiction. But I can see now that these tools, if you've used them enough, are going to put me out of a job very quickly, unless I change. And it's, it just seems so obvious that the, the rate of change is rapidly accelerating that all of us uh, not only risk kind of losing our job, but we're going to risk kind of actually having to retrain, up, unlearn, relearn, and so on. And if you're not prepared for that, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble. I'm very worried about, you know, most business leaders and leaders in general over the next 10 years. So for me, that feels very obvious, but maybe because I'm looking at a slightly longer view now. But I think most people don't see that. And I think it's all going to be business as usual and hunky-dory for the next you know, three to five years. It's not. So uh, nothing could have summed up the entire conversation that we've had uh, 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 better than what you just said. So thank you so much, uh, Damien, for taking time and talking to me today for uh, for this show. Um, I'm pretty sure that the audience will have enough to think about um, when they uh, listen to this conversation. So Wonderful. thank you so thank you much. much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pushing Beyond the Obvious. If you like the show and would like to support please head over to iTunes or wherever you are listening to this show and rate us and write a review. Till next time, have fun.